welcome to our session. It will not just become a superfluous requirement. I hope that you are in the right session because the media organization decided late last night that they want to switch forums. So um, we, originally the plan was that our session would be forum one and uh, the other, this session would be here. So if you're here for the superfluous conference, you're in the right place. I would like to start with the first uh, presentation. Um, I'm Klaus Dufambo, Director of Connected Health and Assistant Consulting Services. So now let's have a look at the current challenges in healthcare. We all know that the demand for healthcare services is increasing, and at the right time, we, we know that the development of the healthcare professionals is not growing as fast as the increasing demand needs it. So the question is, how can technology deal with that problem? Today, we only have a relative shortage of physicians, meaning that, for example, in Germany, we have more physicians than ever before, but we also have more patients who, who demand those services, but the doctors are preferably in the big cities, whereas the patients are all over the country. So there is a geographical distance between the physicians and the patients. And the good news is that technology can help to bridge that gap. Here are a couple of numbers uh, from a recent newspaper article saying that one, one physician's group estimates that there is today a shortage of 6,000 physicians in hospitals and uh, a physician's union, they estimate the shortage of doctors um, around 12,000 uh, uh, doctors in, in hospitals. Okay, bridging to the gap in order to solve the relative unequal distribution of doctors and patients. So when you're a patient using telemonitoring, you can transmit your vital signs over a distance to a healthcare specialist. At the same time, communications technology allows the doctor to give advice to the patient wherever the patient may be. And of course, the doctor consults with other specialists. So that is something that is on the rise um, in industrialized countries. This is an example from North Eastern Germany and parts of Poland, the region is called Pomerania, and the doctors there use high and video conferencing for teleradiology, teleear nose throat, telepathology, telecardiology, telestroke, teletumor board, tele almost everything. This is another example from a European Union funded project as well as the Pomerania project. Uh, this is about intensive care. So the doctors at the university hospitals give on-demand advice to their colleagues in the smaller hospitals in the region. And in phase two of this research project, they will evaluate home offices for doctors. Because you can imagine when you have a shortage of doctors, it makes sense to keep as many doctors in the workforce as you can. And if you have well-trained physicians who are not able to work full or part-time in a hospital or GP office, but might be able to work from home when it, their time schedule allows, then you could use home offices in order to, to um, allow these physicians to do some work with patients. This is an example, very famous children's hospital in London. If you watch the opening ceremony of the, the London Olympics, you might remember this picture of the Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. They're also very active in using communications technology provide services for children, not just in the UK, but also around the world. This is an example from Berlin, where tele teleradiologists sitting in Berlin are providing services to rural hospitals um, at a large distance. And in the past, the radiologist, once a week, sat in a car and drove to all these hospitals. Big waste of valuable physician time. Now they are staying in Berlin increase their services level because they can do several sessions per week and they save all the time and money um, that they spend in the past on traveling around. This is an example from the UK. It's a private doctor service not, not um, related to the NHS. Uh, if you have 
have a smartphone or video camera, then you can consult with a licensed doctor. Um, the previous examples, that was doctor to doctor communication, which is, for example, permissible in Germany, but where Germany has a leg, that is doctor to patient communication. In Germany, it's not allowed for a physician to diagnose a patient using teleconferencing, for example. So, the self restricted regulations which were imposed by the physicians on themselves require that in the treatment process, that at some point in time, there has to be a physical encounter. That is different in other countries like the UK, where you can do these teleconsultations. The funny thing is, uh, the countries today, when it comes to healthcare, are not an island. The same is true for Germany. So, in this case, German doctors founded an internet practice in London, and now they provide teleconsultation services from London to German patients. That is a service they could not provide to German patients from within Germany. But they argue that under European law, this teleconsultation is legal in the UK, and that under European law, the European and the German patient can freely choose their doctor. That was this example. So the next one is um, Swiss pharmacies. 200 Swiss pharmacies today have installed a telepresence system in order uh, and give the opportunity to patients who come into the pharmacy to consult a doctor via video conference. And just a couple of days ago, the organization announced on Swiss television that they are now going to roll out this project to 1,600 Swiss pharmacies. And for the patient, it's a one-stop shopping. They go to the pharmacy, they consult with the doctor. The doctor can consent um, a prescription to the pharmacy, and the patient goes home with his medicine. So the, the shortage is not just affecting the physicians, but also other healthcare professionals have more patients than they can handle. So this is an example of speech therapist. You know, patients who suffer the cerebral stroke have to learn to speak again. So usually they do this one-on-one -on -one with the speech therapist. And this university, they developed an online portal with self-training videos that the patients can use, and then regularly they can consult with their speech therapist using video conference in order to, to monitor the progress. Also, many relatives have to take care of their uh, loved ones. For example, if they suffer from Parkinson's disease or from dementia. And if you know someone uh, in your family or within your friends, then you know that those family caregivers, that is a 24-7 job. So, also in Florida, they, what they did is they provided a video telephone into the, the patient's home so that when the caregiver has a question, they can connect to a specialist and also they can attend virtual self-help groups. Okay, this is an example from India where big hospitals provide those services uh, to rural areas. Another example from China where in the province of Sichuan that suffered a big earthquake a couple of years ago, they are now using a network of physicians and hospitals and even um, mobile GP offices in order to provide services to the patient. This is an example of one of those um, mobile offices they, use, they are using in China. Now, that was uh, what, can, uh, what can ICT do in order to address the misdistribution of doctors and patients? Now, let's think in a couple of years, we know that we have an absolute shortage of doctors and caregivers. So, now what do we do? We know that we won't have enough human beings to provide all the services that the patients need. So, let's have a look at some current trends in healthcare. One is the development of affordable DNA tests for everyone. Another one is the increasing miniaturization of biosensors and the development of expert systems and robotic assistance. So what does science fiction tell us about the future of healthcare? If you're a fan of Star Wars, then you know there is no human doctor anymore. They are using droids. And 
Also, if you're a Star Trek fan, then you know that the Doctor is a hologram or, um, well, at least it doesn't have to be human anymore. And please have a look at this device. For you, those of you who know Star Trek know that this device is called a tricorder, which will play an important role later in the session. I mentioned affordable DNA test. You know, if you if you invest $99 and a little bit of your saliva, then you get your DNA test within a couple of weeks, and then you can go to your doctor and tell your doctor that you uh, have an increased risk for this disease, a decreased risk for other disease, and that there are certain drugs that work good in your body and others where you only have the adverse side effects that you don't want. So the level of knowledge between the patient and the doctor is going to shift. You know, in the past, the doctor had all the knowledge, the patient did not have the knowledge. But then Dr. Google came along, and now nowadays patients go to the physician equipped with the knowledge of Dr. Google. And now the patient gets even more powerful. At the same point, uh, at the same time, the medical devices and the sensors are decreasing. For example, if you remember last time you went to your GP and wanted to have your blood analyzed, usually the doctor takes a couple of tubes, different tubes, with several milliliters of your blood. Now, if you look, have a look at the Samsung devices, that's a small, terrible device, and you only need, need a couple of microliters. And within a couple of minutes, it uh, gives you the results for over 20 of your blood parameters. Whereas today you would have to wait for hours or even days to get the result. And that process is going further. Now, most of you probably have a smartphone. And the smartphone becomes the hub for medical services in the future. Giving you as a potential patient all the power to, con to be in charge of your healthcare. Uh, you can download apps. It is said that there are currently 14,000 apps around, medical apps for smartphones. And if you ever look at, at the latest Samsung phones, that has pre-installed pre software for managing uh, vital signs. A couple of other things. Um, this, is a, sorry, um, this is a device in the upper right-hand corner. Um, when you have asthma, then it, it connects that to a GPS signal and you can, can uh, find out you know, if you, you have an uh, asthma re reaction in a certain place at a certain time. Maybe it's the environment, maybe there are certain plants or trees, or maybe it's, it's pollution, whatever, and you have the ability to better manage your health. Now, just to illustrate that the smartphone will be the Swiss knife of healthcare management, just a couple of examples. This is the smartphone as a thermostat. This is the smartphone as a microscope. You can use it uh, to manage your diabetes. Several companies offer ECGs. Or this is even, you know, this is just software. Standard smartphone, no attachment, just the software enables you to examine the eyes to send the data for example, from Africa to a doctor in London, and he can give you advice what to do with your, your eye problems. This is currently under development, a device when you need glasses. Just use the attachment, it measures your lens, sends the data to the glass manufacturers, and you get, get your glasses later delivered to your home. So no more waiting for weeks to get an appointment at the ophthalmologist, and then wait for another couple of weeks in order to have the class. Now this is an example from Fraunhofer. They programmed one of the, the smartwatches in order to monitor your sleep. So the devices get smaller and smaller. This is a multifunction device and they just raised over 10 million US dollars to get their device through the FDA approval process. And that, that device measures your temperature, your heart rate, your uh, blood um, oxygen saturation, your heart rate variability, and a couple of parameters that are related to your blood pressure. Now, now we have the sensors who get smaller and smaller. Now all you need is to have a user-friendly interface, and several companies are experimenting with avatars. 
And there are pilot studies who tested are these kind of interactions being accepted by the patient? And the answer is yes. For example, a, uh, an American hospital used avatars to enable the discharge process at the end of your hospital stay. And some patients preferred the machine because they said the machine is not rushing me. You know, the nurse is always under time pressure and wants to get things done fast, so the, 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 the patient feels uh, rushed and they prefer to take their own time and use the machine. And there were also experiments even at the end of the 1960s where um, people had the opportunity to use artificial intelligence as a surrogate for a psychiatrist or psychotherapist. And some of the patients preferred again the machine because they said the machine is not judging me. Okay, so um, we have the user-friendly interface and now we need some intelligence to do the diagnostics. And one example is um, the IBM Watson MD project, which Manuela Müller-Gern from IBM will tell you more about in the next presentation. So, and now when you bring the intelligence and the sensors together and combine it into one machine, if you're able to do that, you have a chance to win $10 million, and how you can win the $10 million, that is what Thomas Olsen from Qualcomm will tell you in our third presentation. Now, we need to solve the problem of caregiving, because there will no, not enough professional caregivers be around, and there will not be enough family caregivers around. So, we need to find a solution for that as well, and there are robots under development. I mean, you might smile if you look at the robot because they look a little bit clumsy. But remember what the first mobile phone looked like. It was a small suitcase, very heavy, that you had to carry around. And this is the equivalent of the first mobile phone. Now compare the first mobile phone to what you have in your pocket right now, and you have no trouble imagining where the development is going to go. And, you know, maybe some, maybe some of you today have one of those little robots that clean your floors or clean your windows or mow your lawn. And there are already prototypes who are able to carry around dishes in your house or to, to put your um, clothes into the washing machine. And of course, they will become more and more capable. And all these devices have to be intelligently connected so in order to be able to exchange the data and that will enable you as a citizen, or maybe at one point in time, as a patient, to be at the center and fully in control of managing your health and maybe managing your illnesses. Thank you very much. Now I would like to hand over to Manuela Milagian from IBM, who will tell you all about intelligent systems and how computers are going to diagnose um, and to support the doctors with their diagnosis in the future. Thank you. of data and it is not a technology problem, it is a 
problem of the specifics of uh, the challenges um, um, in, in the specific uh, structure of the healthcare systems itself. So when we talk about data, I'd like um, to um, drive you um, the next couple of minutes to the idea of what's, what is it and why it is so important, uh, how we work today with what's and what kind of examples do we have and what we uh, can expect into the next couple of years. Um, talking about data and about the role of data uh, being um, um, quoted as being the new oil for the future, I just wanted uh, to show you a couple of the parameters um, that um, has also been um, posted by, by, by Klaus, but more specifically to the data. We know that today 90% of the data are uh, no, no older than two years, and 80% of this data are unstructured. Bothers a lot. It, 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 this brings up a lot of challenges, of course. What bothers me most um, and it makes me um, um, very, very nervous is the, um, that one in two business leaders um, don't have access to the data needed for making specific decisions. And what it means for healthcare and for the physician itself, um, you can imagine. So, um, the unstructured data is the most important challenge today. And, and when we talk about unstructured data, we talk about um, social media, we host the voice over IP, um, all the data that have been mentioned in the pilot and in the products available by, uh, by Klaus um, uh, specifically, also the sensors and the devices, the mobile sensors. Um, and when we talk now about uh, big data, we are of course articulate um, immediately the bottom of data, but um, at IBM we talk about the whole ways um, that we have. We have of course the, the large volume of data,
cancer. Um, uh, if I'm laxity of, uh, of cancer, of treating cancer from the very, from giving them the specific treatment options based on the diagnostic is a huge challenge for oncologists. And um, IBM decided in 2011, after this French challenge, um, immediately to invest in focus um, in healthcare, of course, um, which I'm glad for, but uh, specifically uh, in the oncology space in cancer. And what, what we do there, um, we'll come um, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but before um, I, I show you the technology and how it works, and I brought uh, so some uh, some of the screenshots with me, um, I'd like to I, I brought one slide in to show you the, the improvement and the progress of the diffusion technology um, since we um, since we are um, existing over 100 years. Um, we worked in the past, of course, um, uh, with, with with tabulators, with the punch card. Uh, with time cards, readers. Um, it was in um, beginning in um, 1900 uh, to the Second World War. Then we started in the 50s with programming, as we program now software and uh, and uh, computers. We um, integrated machine language then and uh, uh, generated simple outputs based on on the software um, and the programming space that we had. Um, the system that I'm showing um, now in a couple of minutes is. Um, is it is a disruptive technology that is more about uh, prob uh, prob uh, probable, prob probabilistic um, um, issues. It is about um, big data, how to manage in small pieces, you remember that, how to manage it in real time. Um, the first ones, as it was um, um, in, the, uh, in, this, in this quiz show, was programmed that it could uh, answer a question below three seconds. So it is very, very um, and, uh, and it also understands the natural language. The systems need to understand the natural language in order to be very productive and very efficient. Now, I articulated what makes this um, disruptive technology so, so different. Of course, it has a lot of power. It is very, very fast, but it understands the natural language. Um, at this moment in time, English as, as the language, of course, um, it is a system that, is, that needs trained in order to be very efficient. It can be trained on oncology, it can be trained later on, on cardiology, on dialysis, etc., etc. Um, and uh, it, 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 uh, it is based on evidence-based uh, um, questions and it learns um, very, very fast. So um, this, is, uh, this is what, um, what uh, IBM did with the Watson technology. And this is a screenshot um, of, the, of the original of the Watson um, uh, technology where um, a doctor, an oncologist, for instance, um, has um, created um, um, a synthesis uh, with the patient records, with the clinician data, the clinician data, with the data from the history, the pathology reports, the lab reports, etc., um, where he could um, very easily identify based on the reports, the missing pieces, what is missing in the, um, in the treatment, uh, in, the, in the diagnostic plan, in order to get the right decision and um, the system also suggests the oncologist um, um, the right treatment option based on the current information available. So the system will never eliminate um, the uh, physician or the oncologist just to, to answer that question. Of course, uh, it is a decision support system. It, it is really a support system how to manage, how to deal with the complexity of the data um, a physician has today. Now, this is a screenshot um, that we just uh, took over of a patient. She has, uh, she was uh, diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer, um, and uh, the system itself has three um, three um, layers. First of all, um, there is a, a case information about the patient, uh, what kind of uh, reports are um, are um, already done. Um, so go into the deep dive and ask for the evidence where the images, for instance, from the CT um, that the patient um, uh, has, um, has completed. And uh, then you have the, the, the second layer is about the test options um, that uh, the system uh, is giving to the, to the oncologist, to the doctor. And the third one is then the treatment options that are available based on the, on the current, uh, current information. Um, that uh, that is available. Here is the test option screenshot for from the Watson technology, from the technology 
um, from the oncology advisor, uh, where um, the test options, of course, are identified uh, based on the information available. And you could also see, um, for instance, um, the molecular pathology panel. If you go one level deeper to that, you could uh, see the supporting evidence data and criteria why this has been recommended or not. And you can then also see the references on the right side uh, where what's been extracts this data from. Right? Now, and finally, for the treatment options, you have um, based on a sort of preferences from the patient. This patient, for instance, um, uh, um, didn't want it to lose the hairs. So you could also adjust that. You could bring that in into the into the system, and based on the information from the patient and based on the treatment options available today in a specific country, you could uh, you could have um, the options for a treatment for a specific treatment plan, and also with the with the confidence, with the level of confidence, and you could go in a deep dive and see um, and identify why this level of confidence has been calculated. So that's very very important for this kind of uh, decision making or supporting systems. Now, uh, we do with the system a lot um, um, in, the, in the area of medical research, of course, but also on the medical practice and payment side. Uh, we work today with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center um, in the United States and with MD Anderson specifically on, um, on lung cancer, cancer um, uh, options. And we, uh, of course, intend, uh, first of all, to, uh, to, to, to uh, to shorten the time um, for the clinical insights uh, from, from the discovery, from the research side, um, and bring it to the patient, first of all, and secondly, of course, we also uh, try to improve the decisions and outcomes. As you might know, there are a lot of medical errors, um, specifically um, in the cancer area. Um, this is um, what we are doing at the moment at the National Cancer Center in Heidelberg. Um, we have created a huge database for next generation sequencing. Heidelberg is uh, doing a lot of sequence, um, DNA sequencing uh, for patch brain tumor for prostate cancer together with Martini Clinic um, at the UPA Ecuador um, and uh, for another disease. And they are part of an international cancer um, um, consortium um, per, uh, per country. And um, in order to to, to analyze, to modelize the data and to simulate data for cancer, you need to store them. And the storage is the one here in the middle. Is that what we did? We created a large-scale data facility in order to enable the scientists to store the data and to do their research projects. Now we are moving in the next phase, um, going into analytics and uh, trying to identify um, specific patterns that are important for cancer diseases. What's next? Uh, we um, don't create such a disruptive technology just for uh, for big, um, big, and but we would like to deploy that in the different um, industries and in the different areas. And one of um, the most important things um, is the Watson uh, technology, as it was, was a research project, and we need to deploy that now to make that available uh, for other industries, uh, but uh, to make it available also for other countries so that you. Um, uh, could uh, make use of it and we create the platform, uh, the capabilities, the, of course the machine learning piece, the data piece, the analytics, the cloud, we bring it to the mobile devices of course um, and uh, of course um, the cloud service is, really, uh, is one of the most important ones because it, it makes it more cheaper, more um, scalable, uh, better available for uh, different use cases of course. This is uh, what I just talked about. Um, we know that in Germany um, there have been extremely restrictions uh, related to, to healthcare and to healthcare data. Um, within the cloud, we have been able to launch a specific um, use case at the University Hospital in Aachen uh, with the electrician file actor with the case management um, in a private cloud um, um, where a lot of uh, other clinics and physicians are, um, are taking advantage out of that. And, uh, so under the under the data um, and privacy security um, rules, I think this is uh, an affordable next step um, that uh, that comes um, uh, to uh, also new services, but also to new business model in itself. Um, I think that um, IBM is, um, has not the, the ambition 
uh, to be a healthcare provider or a healthcare company in the future, our DNA lies in the management of data and innovation, how to bring that data um, and that just challenges around the big four Bs um, in the market. Um, and of course, we need partners, we need research collaborations, um, we uh, need um, use cases that are coming from the industry uh, because we believe, we actually believe that um, that within the healthcare with all the challenges that we have, we, can, uh, we, we need to join forces together. And um, with that, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. First, Klaus started with really interesting perspectives on how things are changing, and I think overall it's clear to see that it's been very consumer-driven for, let's say, technology supporting consumers and being involved in the healthcare, maybe taking tasks themselves, but at least being involved more than before. Um, just talking about kind of like well, missing 6,000 doctors in Germany, as I understand today, and maybe 12,000 in the near future. I think that's a compelling message that shows that we need technology to do something to help. Um, and it's really also the thing to see Manuel talking about how IBM, a global player, is just making meaning out of the global data um, and, and making that available also to the healthcare sector. Um, if we move then to, uh, to what, what the, the XPRIZE is all about, I think this is a very visionary um, set up to create technologies that is very much in line with her here. And I'd like to, uh, for you to keep this, this data in mind, these, these informations in mind. Uh, but we just see this little movie to start with, and then I have a few more information about um, about the tricolor here. Okay. Prize already on the road, I believe. Um, X Prize is an organization that is self-promoting, let's say, more entrepreneurship, um, and not 
not so much, let's say, R&D programs. This is about experimenting, developing new products, new technologies, and bringing it to market. Uh, Qualcomm Foundation decided to support this for more than five goals with in my science, with a $10 million grant. Um, would anyone like to know how to win $10 million? Yes? <laughs> Good. So, but um, the conditions are really that the winner will be the solution that is creating an anvil, a solution that weighs no more than US is it five pounds, I guess, at least in Europe that's about 2.5 kilos. Um, and that is basically empowering the consumers to be involved in their own health. That's the condition, that's all I have to do. Yeah. It's already started. Um, um, and we have. Is this on? Um, and we had uh, 300 teams signing up across the world, basically. Um, there was a lot of overlap within these teams in terms of what they wanted to achieve and the ideas they have and so on. So it, it came down to uh, today 34 teams across nine countries competing. You can go to the uh, to the website of Ace Prize and get more information on these. Klaus showed the products Scanadu. Um, what's this? What's this one example of, of the participants in the so, uh, so take a look at that. This is really, I would say, very inspiring, very interesting to what these guys are shooting for. Um, and it's actually on the relatively short term. The competition is up. It was launched at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas um, about a year ago. And we are in the creation and testing phase will run another year and then the testing and the new course ceremony in 2015. Um, so just a few more notes to, to that. So what is what is really interesting about this, I would like to note this is the Qualcomm Foundation is sponsoring this. There's no Qualcomm people on the board uh, in the XPRIZE. It's medical doctors that's chosen by the XPRIZE, XPRIZE Foundation. There's no requirement to use Qualcomm wireless technology in, in all of this place. That's important to know. But if you look at wireless um, in general, what is what is making a real difference now? We all know smartphones. What is the difference between this one and the smartphone? Well, one of the things is, besides the smartphone being more compact, it's always online. You don't have to reboot, start up, restart, whatever you call it. It's always on, so it's always, it could be always updated, upgraded with the newest, let's say, applications, newest technologies, monitoring your health. Um, so that is accelerating, I would say, the whole the, the space in terms of getting access to technologies, promoting, promoting the consumer-driven um, healthcare part. Um, and then I would like to finish off, we talk a lot about this part of the world, the western part of the world, Germany, US, this is, uh, this is about global reach. Um, and what, what does this mean? Recently, in one of the fifth poorest countries, I was sitting in a hut, a clay hut. This is out in the middle of nowhere, in Bonitas, Spain. It's actually where Stanley Midbuck and Livingstone lives when I was there. Um, what happened there is, you're sitting here, these guys have nothing, there's no water, there's no power, out in the middle of nowhere. These two white people and 20 locals, they're very curious, very nice people, one speaks English, translating for everybody else, asking us a lot of questions. Um, in the middle of this conversation, this one guy, he asked, are you on Facebook? Okay, there's nothing out there. Yes, I'm on Facebook. All right, let's, let's connect. He takes out a smartphone. It's not an iPhone, it's not an expensive device, but it takes out a smartphone. These guys walk kilometers to get water. They also walk kilometers to get power. But I think that, to me, is a sign that the platform is already there, basically. Um, it is possible, if you have the right technology running on this platform, to reach other parts of the world, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Manuela and uh, Thomas. Now we have about five minutes left, so um, I would like to give the opportunity to you to ask questions if you like. Yeah, um, just give you the microphone in just a second. You were first and then you. Uh, thank you. I have the biomedical 
engineering department. The bottom of the right one is for us is the accuracy of the data you gather from the equipment. So we are distributing a lot of equipment to sample users and we are not sure about the calibration and the results that you're getting out. But I think this is a great limiting factor in this technology that needs to be attended to. But do you think that there is a difference when the doctor does the testing in, in, um, in his GP office compared to, to using mobile or smaller devices? When you're getting the blood results, for example, or blood pressure tests, it's a big nightmare for us to calibrate these sample gadgets. I know that, you know, I mentioned in my presentation the Samsung um, carryable lab, and they did some testing compared the results of their lab on a, on a disk to a standard lab, and they, they reached basically the same yeah, results. But, but from day to day, the equipment can change if you have lasers emitting light or the sensors. It will vary if you drop it on the floor. So the quality control and the results that you're depending on to make your diagnosis is a very critical factor for you. Yeah, I, I agree. But you have the same in the GP's office, you know, that when a patient comes to the GP office, gets his blood pressure taken, you know, you can't rely on the results. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Prado. I'm from the Netherlands. First of all, thanks for the introductions. I'm actually representing a couple of informal investors who are investing in smaller companies uh, in the medical space. Uh, one of the key uh, core, core questions we basically have is to really make change, because I think one of the main points is that we all have great technology. We all are patients that require, let's say, to, uh, to have part of our care at home, uh, let's say more and more at home or mobile. But the key is how to make those changes in the, in the medical system. Can you maybe share some experiences in that space? It's a big question. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a tough question, but maybe I start and you can continue then. Um, for, for Germany, speaking for Germany, we need a kind of to have a basic infrastructure so to, to make data available from, 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 from A to B when it is necessary under the rules and circumstances that we have here in Germany under the um, under the uh, basically proof and all, uh, all that um, other other legacy uh, rights. Um, I think that's 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 given, and I think the the, the government um, will uh, push that now forward. I think um, a second trend which we at the moment see is the empowerment of the patients themselves before they get sick. And we have uh, very very nice examples with patients like me. Uh, we have uh, launched a patient engagement platform, uh, not in Germany uh, because the market is not there, not now. We talk about the second. The, uh, the second healthcare market, but we have this uh, launched in Israel, for instance, in Korea, in uh, in the emerging countries where this is very 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 needed, and I think this trend will continue to develop and will come as a trend. Thank you. Is it the right question? I think for the big companies, this is no idea. Welcome. The responsibility is very much about creating the platforms that are living up to, let's say, the regulatory requirements, but at the same time making it easy for startups uh, with the great ideas, fast mothers, to be able to deliver these solutions on, let's say, a regulated platform, but still very user-friendly, as it should be if it is meant for, let's say, consumer use. I would also like to add to, to, the, to the question. Yesterday there was a session here in Forum 1 and someone said, well, telemedicine has been around for 20 years and not much happened, you know? So, but the good thing is, I mean, national healthcare systems, they move slow, they move very slow or they do not move at all because there is a tendency to preserve the current state. And in the past, there was not much a patient could do about it. But now with these devices becoming so small and so affordable, it's now the patient who makes the decision. The patient does not have to wait for a doctor to offer him the device or for a health insurance company to pay for the device like in the past. I mean, they buy smartphones worth a couple of hundred uh, dollars or euros. You know, they also buy these um, thermometers and uh, glucose monitors for their smartphones. So it's the patient who makes the decision and the consumer will see the value and they will buy it and they will make the, the market move. And so the, the national healthcare system, from my point of view, are always lagging behind. And maybe they can even become
Maybe one other comment on that, yeah. Um, I mean, um, the transformation in the industry is also moving around with a lot of speed. Um, um, for instance, Pharma is um, technically now how they want to invest in the healthcare market. This has never been happened before. That's, and, 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 a, and they will take over another job because they have the data, they have, uh, um, they have the investment available, and they move along um, on the telemedicine part, on the, on the app side, and they also create around their products and their drugs new services. And I think this is this is pushing the market really, really much forward. Okay, but uh, I think one of the key aspects we see with small companies, at least when they do trials, is that you need a specialist or a doctor to be involved because you want to have quality care, right? I mean, information by the internet about your diagnosis, I mean, who can trust it? I mean, uh, it's a big issue, but I guess the involvement of a specialist and a doctor is key uh, to be able to approve the procedure diagnosis. But that's the important point. You know, you don't need the national infrastructure, but what needs to be done is to get FDA approval. Because, you know, in the US, you might know that the FDA now realize that they have to do something because there are so many medical apps around and no one tested them for quality. And that is something that the national systems need to do. Will the companies provide the services and the, the, uh, the governments they have to make sure that when the patient buys or the citizen buys those stuff, that is a quality assured and a reliable medical device. You know, just the traditional medical device, for example, a blood pressure cup that you buy at the supermarket today. Thank you. Okay, we have already officially two minutes past our time. Any last urgent question? Okay, obviously not, not at the moment, so it's time to, to conclude our, our session. Um, thank you very much, first of all, to Manuela and, and Thomas and to you as an audience. And in order to answer the question, will physicians become EPUB first to requirement? Yes, they will, but not so fast. And the first step will be that the physician will get support in order to get to a quality decision faster and you as a patient, you don't need to go to the